Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing myself in my indigenous language. Halito Chimachukma Saochifiat Carson, Chatasia. Hello, my name is Carson. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and one of the Native American Law Student Association co-presidents, along with McKenna Kawane and Marissa Yuri. I'm excited to be here with you all today. Before we begin this convocation ceremony, I want to acknowledge the land we are on. Stanford sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Moakma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. Today and going forward, I challenge you all to think about how our ability to study and live on this land is intrinsically interconnected with the lives of the Moekma Ohlone. And as you continue on with your studies and future career, I invite you to think about how the law can and does impact indigenous peoples. I encourage you to uplift and amplify their voices. Yakoke, thank you. In a spirit of honor and reverence, let us be together. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون. God commands justice, goodness, and generosity, and forbids what is shameful, blameworthy, and oppressive. He advises you so that you may know. As you enter this new journey, May you be grounded in justice and compassion. In a world flooded with information and parched for justice, guide our learning, our teaching, our living with courageous loving directed toward the common good. So in all we do, let us bring to it hearts of wisdom. May we care for one another as we care for ourselves. May we ever remain curious, steadfast, engaged. Finally, with open hearts, discerning minds, and compassionate action. May we all continue to be these things and more as seekers of justice, equity, and peace for the benefit of all humanity. Amen, Ashe, and Amin. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, I would love to welcome everybody that's standing over there. There's a lot of seats. If all of you guys want to come and have the courage to join us here, don't be shy. You get a prize because there's kind bars in those seats. Otherwise, you might be deprived. Thank you, Dean Martinez. Or should I say, soon to be Provost Martinez. I don't know if you know about the incredible leadership. from Dean Martinez, but we're very, very grateful for your contributions to our community and for what's to come. And thanks to all of the students for being here, for the faculty, administration, and staff. Thanks for investing the time to be here today. So do any of you guys know what are pleated trousers? <laughs> well, 30 years ago, I was walking around Stanford starting to meet new students and nobody shared the memo with me that those had gone out of fashion like two decades before. <laughs> and they were not just pleats, which from what I'm told are the most offensive of pleats. <laughs> and I was walking around meeting fascinating students, as you probably have already discovered, just an incredible student body. In my class, there were former ambassadors there was an award-winning artist. There were three medical doctors, very accomplished business people, a decorated war veteran. And then there was this confused Mexican Jewish college graduate wearing pleated trousers. To be clear, they were just not pleated trousers. They had this like thick, woolly texture, kind of like the one that my ancestors had worn in the 1920s in a cold Eastern European winter. And in the meantime, the former ambassadors, who I guess had gotten the memo, wearing like khaki shorts without pleats. So why am I starting to tell you all this? 
because if in the coming days or weeks you start suffering from imposter syndrome, if you start wondering if the admissions office made a mes mistake in welcome welcoming you here, just remember that at least you're not wearing pleated trousers. You're okay. But we don't want you to just be okay. We want you to soar over the coming three years and beyond in your professional careers, in your personal lives, and in your contributions as citizen leaders. And if I were to give you any advice on what skills to hone in while here at Stanford Law School, particularly given the times that we're going through, the skills to deal with difference. to overcome challenges and disagreements. Now, I think Stanford Law started by giving you an initial challenge because I noticed there were some dark chocolate and sea salt, some cranberry almonds, some different flavors, and so far I have not seen anybody fighting over which flavor they wanted, so that's a good start. But when you go back and think about what brought you to this campus on this moment, you may find that the roots on your journey go back to your personal upbringing, back in your family history. Is this okay for you guys, or should I? Um, are you? Uh, is the noise coming and going, or is it okay? You, you can hear me, okay? So so. Um, I might, I'm going to try to go in case. Is this a little bit better? I want it to be more vile, but. I'm a little bit afraid that the noise is coming in and out, so I'll just try to be here. I first became enthralled with the rule of law when I immigrated to the United States as a 16-year-old from Mexico, and I discovered American democracy. I was fascinated that my classmates could feel comfortable criticizing the US president without fear of landing in jail. I found it interesting that even late night TV hosts could mock anybody they wanted and make fun of politicians or powerful business leaders without fear of retribution. And I found it very interesting that in Washington DC, political representatives could vehemently debate with one another, only to then go out and work across the aisle to solve problems and go to dinner as friends. For me, Liberal democracy and the freedoms that come with it are magical. And they're magical because they allow our society to thrive and make the most out of our diversity of thoughts and backgrounds. I was drawn to law school as a place where I could develop the skills to safeguard the values and liberties that enable us to live together in harmony. Rule of law in liberal democracies is not only about justice and fairness. Our marketplace of ideas with the freedoms to protect them and the kindness to debate them allows the best ideas to rise while respecting the contributions from all who come into the debate. What makes liberal democracies so magical is that instead of discouraging our differences, as autocracies or totalitarian regimes might, it rewards them. It shows us that the best way to spur personal fulfillment and societal progress is not to hide from difference, but to derive strength from it. An ability to forge relationships with those different from us builds the foundational trust necessary to solve problems openness and different ideas and comfort with respectful disagreement is what fuels the creativity of our entrepreneurial system. The skills to deal with difference are what ultimately allowed us to turn kind into what it is today. They're the same thing that differentiates between being kind and being nice. Have you, have you guys heard of the difference between being kind and being nice? A lot of people confuse kindness with weakness because they associate kindness with niceness. There's nothing wrong with being nice, but it doesn't require the strength of kindness. You can be nice and be passive, but kindness requires action. 
If you're nice, you're polite. But if you're kind, you're honest. And honesty requires strength. If one of your friends just ate a salad that has a big piece of lettuce between their teeth, if you're nice, you don't embarrass them. You just walk away and run away. <laughs> but if you're kind, you have the courage to invade their space and point that out and spare them further embarrassment. It actually takes strength to do that. If you're nice, you don't cause problems. But if you're kind, you solve problems. If you're nice, you don't bully. But if you're kind, you stand up to the bully. Kindness truly is the oil that lubricates the machinery of democracy and makes our country function. A kind culture is a high-functioning culture in which you don't avoid tough conversations. You embrace them, trusting one another, assuming positive intent. The most valuable relationships I've forged that kind were with people that were very, very different from me and that had the courage to tell me when I was wrong. For example, John Leahy, the president at kind for many years, had never tried sushi prior to my meeting him. And he was m many years older than I. I forced him to eat sushi that first day, so it was maybe not so kind of me, but he ultimately enjoyed it. But he and I could not have been more different politically, in terms of our skill sets, but we complemented one another and we demonstrated that we could work together in, as partners. And that allowed us to create a model for all of our team members to transcend differences and to find a way to work together. Ellie Lanning, who, used, who started as a junior communications team member, ended up becoming one of the most important people at KIND and today runs my entire investment firm Camino Partners because she was comfortable respectfully disagreeing with people and pointing out where we could do things better. I've tried my best to surround myself with people like Michael and Sarah right here that are comfortable telling me when I might be wrong and are comfortable bringing a hearty debate to the issue. On the flip side of embracing difference is fear of difference. It's a very destructive force. Fear of different people leads to hate, dehumanization, and the worst evil that humans have perpetrated on one another. Fear of different ideas leads to unforgiving judgmentalism, to cancel culture, to conspiracy theories, and to censorship. These are the forces that snuff out human potential and stifle societal progress. When I was nine years old, I began hearing from my father about what he went through as a Holocaust survivor. He was liberated from the Dachau concentration camp as a 15 and a half year old by American soldiers that flew thousands of miles to liberate an entire continent of people they had never met. My father, other family members, and millions of human beings were bitterly tortured. Millions were brutally murdered, including six million Jews, because others feared and hated them for being different. How could he have come to this? How are the same seeds of hatred and fear being sown in this world today? Why are people so bad at dealing with difference? Dealing with difference is hard. Our brains seem wired to seek the company of those who tell us what we want to hear rather than what we may need to hear. We crave the comfort of like-mindedness. And to some level, tribal belonging is very natural. Yet with the advent of social media, echo chambers, misinformation, and polarization, 
are at all time highs. Algorithms are designed to spread sensationalism and to feed us one-sided propaganda. They make us think we have the absolute truth and that the other side must be evil. We end up living in bubbles without even realizing it and develop terrible habits using news to affirm our beliefs rather than to inform our beliefs. They dull our skills to be introspective and to question our own positions. They shield us from differences. And we may think that we're better for it, but we know that we're not. The result of those silos is terrifying. Why? Because our differences still exist, but with no chance to interact or to learn from one another, we fear them. We deny them. We hate them. So how we deal the difference, how we will deal with difference, makes all the difference. It is truly the skill set on which society will stand or fail. And it's precisely what you will learn at Stanford Law, how to mediate difference. Stanford Law taught me to be a critical thinker so that I may not just blindly accept the dogma from my side. It taught me to listen so that I can truly understand the other side and have a modicum of hope at transcending those differences and overcoming obstacles together. Perhaps most importantly, it taught me to love when I learned that I was wrong. Why? Because you expand your mind when you discover that a fundamentally held assumption was actually wrong. This morning I thought about something I hadn't put in my uh, presentation here, which is here at Stanford, I also came up with the idea for what became my first company. It's called PeaceWorks. And the concept started when I took a legislative course from Dr. Byron Sher, and I created a proposal for how to encourage joint ventures between Arabs and Israelis. And I ended up running PeaceWorks for 25 years, and that gave the seeds for me to create kind. And we had Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians, Turks trading with one another. We had a venture in Sri Lanka between Sinhalese and Tamils in Indonesia, a women's own cooperative between Muslim, Christian, and Buddhist women working side by side. And the whole concept was to use creative models to solve differences, to use market forces to channel positive change in society and get neighbors to shatter stereotypes, to cement relationships, and to work with one another. The reason why I want you to think about PeaceWorks is that over the coming years, many of you guys will go on to become extraordinary attorneys. Um, I don't know if Lily with us is here, but her father, who was my roommate in law school to this day, represents us and is one of the best lawyers uh, that I've ever met. And you might become a judge, you might become a public servant, but you might also come up with other creative ideas for how to channel, use the skills that you developed here at Stanford to start a new idea, a new business, a new social enterprise, a new NGO. And I really want to encourage you to focus on the skill sets that would strengthen you for years to come. But without practice, we can very easily lose the muscles required to work out on our differences. On the other hand, once we exercise and strengthen those muscles, those transformative magical powers of difference can be unleashed. The skills we need to deal with difference are central to a movement called Starts With Us that I'm part of. It has 250 amazing people, plus one pot, uh, and includes Chef Jose Andres, it includes Dr. Bernice King, the daughter of the late Martin Luther King, uh, includes Will I Am and Mark Cuban, and spans a spectrum of politics all the way from Erskine Bowles, a fir former chief of staff to President Clinton, to Karl Rove, the former advisor to President Bush. And what it tries to do is demonstrate that we can all develop the skills to transcend and work through and navigate those differences to solve problems. We organize all of these skills into three buckets that we call the three C's. The three C's are curiosity, compassion, and courage. Curiosity 
even towards the ideas that we might be suspicious of. Compassion, particularly to the people that it might be a little harder for you to get close to and that you might be the most suspect of. And the courage to work across lines of difference to solve problems. We distill the three C's from lessons that we drew from my years at Kind and from other colleagues' enterprises. But when I think about where my seeds of the three C's were planted, it really was here at Stanford, where I learned to be respectful towards those that are different from me. And those different from us are not just people of different faiths, people of different religions or ethnicities or sexual preferences or identities. They're also people with different journeys and viewpoints. Rooted in the Stanford ethos, we're encouraged to compete with ourselves rather than with each other. Make sure to forge bonds with your schoolmates, to focus on become the best that you can be, and to work hard while having a lot of fun. Stanford really, really provides you the environment and opportunity to do both of those things, to grow while enjoying the ride. Now, you may be thinking that the three C's are obvious and wonder why I'm wasting your time talking about them. I'm sure one of you guys really is wondering about that. It's true that in theory, almost everyone agrees that the three C's are good. Almost everyone is aligned with the aspiration. Where we tend to fail is in the execution. Especially when so much in our world requires fixing. Acknowledging a point of view different from ours can feel like capitulation. Feeling compassion or someone who voted differently or who doesn't acknowledge the dangers of, that our society is facing may feel like a betrayal of our values. I'm a confused Mexican Jew, so believe me, I know a little bit about passion. I will always stand up for what I believe in. And do, we do need to stand up to monsters. But 99% of human beings, 99.9% .9 are not those monsters. We will be much stronger at advancing justice, fairness, and democratic values if we strive each day to understand one another. It will require hard work over the next three years and over the rest of your life, in and out of the classroom. But the work is worth it. Because a world full of difference is not enough. We need people in the world that know how to deal with it. I know that you are those people, and I'm so excited for what's ahead for you guys, including over the next three years on this journey in this extraordinary institution and beyond. Thank you so much, and best wishes to all of you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Helena. I am one of your Stanford Law Association co-presidents, um, along with the wonderful, amazing Jessica Shin. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. I uh, realize that the 1Ls advanced degrees and transfer students have been on campus for a while now, so thank you for taking a little break from class. Um, and you'll get some food out of it too, so that'll be a nice bonus. Um, but today I just want to take a little bit of time um, to talk about what my 1L experience was like. Um, I am now a 2L at Stanford. Um, and my 1L gear here was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, the education of law school, I feel like, has been described as a fire hose. And I think in 1L, that is particularly true. I remember there was a week where I learned plausibility pleading in civil procedure, consideration in contracts, and duty in torts, all in the same week. And then at the same time, you're learning to write legal argument in a crack, crack structure. Um, hashtag free Sonia. Um, and you're trying to figure out a new social environment, a new city, and just a new phase of life. Um, and for me, it felt like I was trying to learn how to cook with five burners all going at once. 
And for a perfectionist, also like me, that was a recipe for just extreme stress. It was, it was a really stressful year, and I think that's a natural result of all of the things you're trying to do at the same time. Um, and my instinct um, has been and was to try to just do everything to the best of my ability. I would just study harder, sleep less, like do everything to the best of my ability as much as I could. Um, but I often found myself feeling like I wasn't getting it right and that I was lacking. Sorry, my pages are a little messed up. Um, some weeks I would manage to do all of the readings, but then I would still get the cold call wrong in class, even though I knew the material. Or I would finally get a chance to catch up with an old friend, but I would lose a bunch of sleep because I was still trying to do all of my readings. And it just felt like something was always slightly wrong. Um, and I couldn't tell if that was the growing pains of getting used to law school or at a certain point, if it was something more fundamental. Like maybe I wasn't cut out for Stanford. Maybe I couldn't handle the workload that a Stanford student you know, is supposed to be able to handle. Luckily, I have a very, very nice mom um, who is always willing to let me call and vent whenever I'm really struggling with something. And like many Chinese parents, she always has like a phrase or a Chinese idiom um, that really works for the predicament. So today I want to share with you one of the ones that got me through my 1L year at Stanford. Um, and the Chinese version of it is uh, um, It's not a super popular one, but it roughly translates to the idea that people have five fingers and they all have different lengths. And the meaning of the idiom is that your hand is composed of fingers, some short and some long, and that's what makes your hand useful and that's what makes it work. Um, and if your fingers were all the same length, your hand would, you know, it would be a lot less useful. Um, and it would probably also look pretty weird if all your fingers were the same length. Um, but the, the meaning of the idiom is that we all have different strengths and weaknesses. I think, um, you know, coming into Stanford, I think you come in here and you're here to learn legal doctrine and you're here to learn how to make a difference and do all of these things. But there are other strengths that brought you here that you're probably just not using quite right now, but you will come to use later on. Um, and often now when I think of uh, my hand, I also think of my friends at Stanford. And I think about how we're all such different people. Some of them are like really amazing studiers. Some of them are the most funny people I've ever met. Some of them are amazing cooks. Everyone just brings something different to the table. And I think that's what makes law school and Stanford in particular such an enriching experience. And so I'll keep it short and end with this. I just kind of want to remind everyone here, especially the people who are just joining our community, your job while you're here is not to get everything right. You're not supposed to get every cold call right. You're not supposed to get every H. You're not supposed to knock every single thing you do out of the park, even though sometimes I know it can feel that way. Your job is just to learn something about yourself and learn something about the friends around you and make some nice connections. Enjoy the fact that you, know, you get to go hiking if you want to for like 20 minutes drive. You can go on a really beautiful hike. Um, I went on one yesterday. That's why that's top of mind. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say today and thank you and welcome to everybody and hope we have a good year. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Shin and I'm excited to stand up here on behalf of SLA as well. And a fun fact is that it was Helena's birthday yesterday. So if you see her around campus, feel free to give her a big happy birthday. Um, and also my pronouns are she, hers. So thank you again for coming here and spending time with us under the Dwight tents. I had a little note about the weather today because I woke up and it was super gloomy and I was like, oh no, not in California. But in nice opportune timing, it's nice and sunny out here today. So I wanted to take a little moment to address everyone here. You know, to the 1Ls and the advanced degree students, it's good to see everyone here again, this time not at a waterless term and fountain. I know the past three weeks have been a whirlwind of new experiences, from your first set of doctrinals, cold calls, and the occasional bar review, to learning an entirely new, different legal system. As most of you have figured out, law school is not intuitive at all, and so you should be so proud of how far you've come the past few weeks. To our new transfer students, the class of 2025 is so excited to welcome you. While you all are navigating the ropes of life here at SLS and learning the new peculiarities such as when to go to the coffee closet during non-peak times, we are equally excited to learn from you and the wealth of experiences that you bring here. 
To my fellow 2Ls, it's nice to see everyone back on campus and their post-summer glow. I think we can all agree that summer was quite short, but we're excited to embark on the new set of questions and challenges that await for us in 2L. And to the, to the thrills in the audience, I'm excited. Um, it's great to see everyone here. And thank you again for being the leaders and mentors who have set the groundwork for us today. It's sad to think that this is our final year together, but I know today marks the start of an incredible year. Although I addressed everyone separately, one message I wanted to impart here today as we usher in the new school year is a sense of community across the entire student body. Often in law, we forget about the personal. We forget about the people that we're talking about in class, and we only focus on the black letter law takeaways. Even the act of studying can be quite isolating. So I hope as we step away from the tent here and mark the start of a new year, we bear a sense of responsibility in shaping this incredibly diverse, thoughtful, and brilliant community. Lucky for us, it only takes a few to shift the critical mass here at Stanford, and I hope you all take that as a sign to truly invest in the people around you and take up space. After all, these are the people that we will call up when we're pivoting from our third to fourth career change, experiencing another life existential crisis, and the occasional legal advice. So reach out to that person who said something incredibly brilliant in class today, grab coffee with your section mates, and talk to one another. And also join the, one of the many student organizations at the student fair this Friday, including SLA. We have such a unique opportunity to shape our time here at SLS. And as our keynote speaker said, it's important that we be intentional about it and be kind to one another as we embark in the year ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica and Helena. And thank you to our keynote speaker, Daniel Lubetsky. I think all of these speeches struck a common theme of kindness and about what the mission of the law school is. Um, convocation is a new tradition that we instituted at the law school about five years ago. Con commencement when you graduate is another time when we come together under a white tent on this lawn. And it always struck me that it was unusual that we talked about what our journey through law school was about only when students were about to leave the law school and commence onto their careers. And convocation is designed to bring us together at the beginning of the journey each year uh, to reflect on what our purpose is as a community here. And that includes all of our students across the different years and degree programs, our faculty, our staff, our alumni. And as uh, the keynote speaker talked about, as a law school, our mission is in very crucial ways devoted to sustaining democracy and the rule of law. And that makes our educational endeavor different than some other kinds of study. At the same time, like all educational institutions and like all of Stanford, part of the experience here, especially for students, is also the growth as human beings during your time here. And that includes everything that takes place outside the classroom as well as inside the classroom. Whether it's a hike at the dish, volunteering in the community, or simply sitting around talking with friends and supporting one another through the ups and downs of life in the law school, the bonds that we form with each other here on campus are an essential part of the Stanford Law School experience. We're an amazing community. Just to talk about the students here, there are 679 students enrolled at Stanford Law School this year, 577 JD students and 102 advanced degree students, including JSDs, JSMs, and LLMs. We also have eight foreign exchange students joining us for the quarter. And the students hail from nearly every state in the US as well as dozens of countries around the globe. You're graced with athletic skills. You're polyglots with ancient Greek, Middle Egyptian, Azerbaijani, and Uyghur being among the less common languages spoken. You love the outdoors. You're talented musicians from playing instruments recreationally as well as professionally to singing to composing. You write poetry and you perform open mic poetry. You give your time generously to causes you believe in. You raise bantam chickens and homing pigeons. You're interested in wildlife conservation. You spend time on arts and crafts. You garden, you build furniture. You're avid podcast listeners as well as creators of your own podcasts. You're enthusiastic debaters. You tutor from students to test takers to people who are incarcerated. 
In your pre-Stanford Law School life, you've instructed young minds from elementary school students to college students to underserved youth. You've interned with DA offices and public defenders. You've gained experience as paralegals. You've worked with nonprofits. You've worked in the national security field, the Department of State, Department of Defense, and Department of Treasury. You've served in the military, and you've worked alongside our country's political leaders. You've become published writers. You've worked on COVID-19 response teams. You've gained experience in crisis management. You've been certified in wilderness first aid. With all those interests and talents, you have so much to bring to this community and to your future career as lawyers and as citizens and leaders across society. As I look out on all of you, this group of extraordinarily talented people, I'm filled with a sense of optimism. I know that our collective future is bright because in a few years, all of you will be focusing your considerable talents on making a difference in a myriad of ways across the globe. You came here by many paths and you will follow many different paths in your journeys after Stanford Law School. Your job, as I've told you before, is to explore and figure out what path will be meaningful to you. This comes with uncertainty, but I encourage you to embrace that uncertainty with courage and to explore. Uncertainty can be uncomfortable, but with discomfort comes new understanding and change. And so let me suggest that you consider these uncomfortable moments as part of the opportunity you have to grow during your time here at Stanford and as springboards for expanding your skills and deepening the knowledge and training that you came here to obtain. You've just heard from the law school's inspiring alum, Daniel Lubetsky, and I hope the message he brought to you today will influence the way you think about the careers that you're launching during your time here at SLS, about the citizens and leaders you'll be after you leave, and the kinds of friends and community members you'll be to one another with courage, compassion, and curiosity. What strikes me most about the way Daniel has chosen to live his life and use what he learned here on the farm is his focus on bringing people together. As he talked about, in a liberal democracy, law is the way that we reconcile our most profound differences. In a democracy, law is the way we resolve disagreements, not with violence or mere power, but with reason, principle, and ideally, humanity and compassion. I urge you to start building those bridges while you're here at SLS. I cannot stre stress enough the importance of the connections and ties you'll make with your fellow students while you engage in your studies here. And as Jessica and Helena talked about, one of your greatest resources when you leave will be the connections you've made amongst your fellow classmates. So, with that, I also want to talk about the other people who are here, our amazing faculty and staff who keep this place running day in and day out. Our staff include people from all across different skills and expertise, from librarians to IT staff to administrative support. These professionals bring so much to the experience that you have here at Stanford Law School, and it's worth taking time to stop as you go about your business and thank them. We also have an amazing faculty. The 63 faculty here at Stanford Law School mark our international and international leaders in their fields. Whether publishing fast ranking scholarship or mentoring students one-on-one, -on -one, I believe we have the best law faculty in the world. And speaking of the faculty, this is also an occasion on which we announce an award for one of our faculty. One of our annual prizes is the Barbara Allen Babcock Prize for Excellence in Teaching. Barbara Allen Babcock was the first woman on the Stanford Law School faculty, appointed after establishing a pioneering career providing legal defense services to the poor, including as the first director of the DC Public Defender Service. She was a legendary scholar and teacher here and won the John Bingham Hurlbut Teaching Prize, which is awarded at commencement four times in no small part because of her experience and skill as a trial lawyer, her love for the practice of law, her scrupulous preparation for every class, her unique gift for bringing cases and the real life consequences of litigation to life through storytelling, and the extraordinary effort she made to connect with students of all backgrounds and to support them through law school and well afterwards as a mentor. 
This prize was established to recognize instructors in the 1L required curriculum who promote inclusive learning, intellectual rigor, and commitment to the highest standards of professional integrity, mentorship, and service. It's my deep pleasure to award th this year's Barbara Allen Babcock Prize to Professor Julian Yarko. Professor Nyarko has received exceptional evaluations for his teaching and mentorship of students. One student remarked, Professor Nyarko always went above and beyond to explain concepts clearly and succinctly. He was very clear on expectations, which greatly helped me determine what I was supposed to be doing and adapt to law school classes in general. Another student said this, Professor Nyarko made every day of contracts not only education, but also fun and engaging. From his many memes about contracts doctrine to his personal experience with German hens versus chickens, and I have to follow up on that one, um, I look forward to his class and feel like I got a lot out of that as a result. The student feedback we received combined with what was already known about Julian's dedication to his teaching demonstrates that he embodies the ethos of the Babcock Prize. Julian, I'm so proud to present you with this award today and glad we can all celebrate your accomplishments. Just very briefly, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, I love teaching 1Ls. 1Ls are really special. Um, the excitement in the eyes of 1Ls, especially in the very first class, or first few classes. Um, the preparedness, you know, people are eager to, particip to participate. Um, my office hours are full, usually, which is also great. Um, there's of course nothing against 2Ls and 3Ls, you're all great as well, <laughs> uh, you know this, um, but you have been 1Ls once and so you know how special it is. Um, uh, I interpret uh, the award as um, you know, a sign that some of the love is coming back, which is great. I choose to imp interpret it as a sign that uh, you like contracts and you like contracts memes, so I'll keep those coming. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Congratulations again uh, to Professor Nyarko. Thank you to Daniel Lubetsky, to Jessica and Helena for speaking. With that, we'll conclude with a benediction and then I invite everyone to join us for lunch to kick off the new school year. Thank you. Let us be together. As this moment comes to a close, we turn toward the journey unfolding before us. In the days and the weeks to come, may we develop the skills to build with difference, reaching across divides to overcome challenge and conflict. May we learn to revel and take delight in the individual strengths we each bring, even as we nurture relationships and cultivate community. And may we hold fast to the optimism of this day, of this moment, as we explore the myriad of paths out, stretching out before us, embracing the moments of discomfort as signs and symbols of our growth. And above all else, may we always seek to be kind, rooting ourselves in the strength courage and curiosity to solve problems as together, together, we work toward a world marked by peace with justice and compassion beyond measure. Together, we say amen, amin, and ashe. So may it be this day and all others. Thank you.